Hello everyone. This is Toby from the Phuket Meditation Center and you're listening to the Dharana Meditation Podcast. Let's sit together, calm the busy mind and explore topics concerning character development, meditative training and deeper self-knowledge. Sitting upright, the head gently suspended from above. Body relaxed, at ease. Got a nice example here of balance between striving and releasing. not favoring one over the other. Breathe in a way that feels nice, refreshing, comfortable. And as everything relaxes, slows down, you'll find that your breath naturally sinks down into the belly. Receiving the experience in this moment with kindness, with compassion, giving everything space to be just as it is. There's nothing to change, nothing to get rid of, nothing to accumulate. Gradually let your whole body fill with consciousness, 
saturating every cell. As you breathe out, releasing, softening all the unnecessary tension, all those holding patterns in the body begin to dissolve, to melt. Synchronizing your body and consciousness, really bring them together. Coming more deeply into this moment. Keep it simple, breathing in feeling, breathing out, releasing, softening. Simply knowing your experience in this moment, whether it be hearing the sounds, feeling the sensations, witnessing the arising, passing of thought, words and images,
there's nothing other to do than to know, to see. Liberating, freeing and releasing all experiences from our control, our grasping, our trying. Just let it all be. And you will still notice those tendencies, those impulses to do, to try, to get somewhere, to become someone. Just notice that they exist. It's a natural, normal part of the mind, a remnant of your past. Just let it arise and pass naturally. There's nothing to do to it. Even let go of meditation, trying to be to establish some focus or be meditative or mindful or anything like that. Let go. Release it. Just rest in this openness.
in order to deepen this release, the right conditions need to be in place. So let's stabilize the knower, the consciousness, by directing it onto the breath. Simply just knowing the breath. As you breathe in, knowing that you're breathing in, breathing out, knowing that you're breathing out. Now, right now we are making an effort to keep the mind with the breathing. Very gently, persistently coming back to the breath. You can think of this one breath as one meditation session. Notice that at first we were sitting in this complete openness. But right now we are cultivating a skill. The first part is the part of releasing, softening, opening. This part is about cultivation, striving, building. Both need to exist in harmony.
Now release intention again. Opening up, nothing to do, nothing to try. Release the breathing. Simply observe the arising and passing of experiences within this open, empty space of consciousness. releasing so far that you are not even trying to be conscious. Whenever the light of consciousness arises, simply rest in it. Not grasping it, not holding it, not trying to prolong it even. Just rest. If you find that the mind and consciousness become very foggy, hazy, dull, and you get lost in all kinds of stories and thoughts, 
then it is better to practice anchoring yourself in the breathing. Just being with your breath, stabilizing the knower. If you find that you are perfectly able to stay completely open without grasping any of the experiences that arise and pass, then stay there, rest. If you like, you can slowly come back in your own time, open your eyes, gently stretch your body a little bit. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Nice to see all of you. Today, uh, I've received a question from one of the students, Jagdish. He wrote in, and he, he well, I just read what he what he wrote in. I was fortunate to be able to attend the session on Thursday, seventh March, and meet you in person. You advised me to maintain proper posture and sit for at least thirty minutes. And I'm glad to share that I worked on this and been able to disconnect from my back pain. I'd like to thank you for your guidance and blessings. I'm facing another challenge with regards to my mind wandering and find it difficult to maintain focus not only during meditation but in general, also during my daily life, work and activities like a conversation or networking, etc. How do I manage to be able to connect with others and keep the focus and be in present moment and consciously aware? I don't feel content and enjoy myself completely. I've been in a buff state for a long time, many years, and I wander in my imagination, feel lost. Lately, I've been able to achieve good insights and clarity, but still not sure about many things in life. First of all, I'm really happy um, to, to hear that he's putting in the work. That's awesome. Being able to sit still for longer and longer amounts of time is the basic foundational work that I think everybody seriously interested in meditation practice should train. This ability and um, balance it with proper exercise, yoga, stretching, mobilizing, loosening, strengthening, and so on and so forth. So we maintain the health of our body and uh, connect it more and more with the mind. So this is, as I said, foundational work. Maybe first of all work for the achievement of sitting still for 30 minutes, then gradually extend to an hour until you're able to sit perfectly still at ease for an hour without any pain, without any stress, 
without any inner struggles, no fighting, perfectly open, released, at ease. So that's the, that's the very first thing. And it's great because you can measure this. A lot of people, they would say, oh, it's so hard to do meditation practice because there's nothing really to measure. Well, th that's the measurement. How long are you able to sit still for and find peace in it? And that kind of leads me into the topic of today's um, session, which is all about a balance between striving, building, trying, and releasing, opening, letting go. These two facets. I think the path can really be broken down into these two facets. One of my teachers in Thailand actually said that this is the only thing that you need to do. One, follow your duty, and two, let go. Just two things. Question is, what's my duty? Well, that's determined by who you're hanging out with, um, by higher ideals, by morality, and so on and so forth. We don't need to go too much into this today. But start by making it your duty to achieve one hour of sitting still. It's super basic, super mundane, but so necessary. I've met plenty of people in my time that, you know, had very high-minded ideas about meditation. Like everything is consciousness, uh, the entire world is like a rainbow, like a dream, and so, but they can't even sit still. That's very telling. <laughs> Cannot even sit still. Like basic things are already a disturbance for them. And where do you, you need to test yourself. Where am I disturbed? Am I disturbed? Where can you feel that? You can feel it in the body. Best way to overcome it is by actually training to become still in the body. First kind of thing. So I'm really happy to hear that Jagadish is doing this work. That's awesome. I encourage all of you to do the same. That's the way it's done. Um, all right, and now coming to his second part of the question. He faces another challenge. He finds it difficult to maintain focus, not only during meditation, but in general also. Okay, of course, that's pretty normal. Like, I don't think anybody is able to be really present in their lives just by pushing a button. You come visit a meditation class, read a book, meet an inspiring teacher, whatever it is, and we hear these instructions, be present, be focused, you know, be with this moment, bring your attention to what it is that you're doing right now. And then you will find, oh, my goodness, I'm actually very, very lost. In fact, one of the first big insights is perhaps that. It's to understand what an amount of unconsciousness there is and how much we are reactive, impulsive, just really walking programs, just reacting to the world, reacting to our own sense experiences, reacting to our thoughts, and reacting to our lack of consciousness. Now that's the new thing. Now you're a meditator. So you have that new problem now. Oh, I'm not conscious enough. Really, that's an extension of I'm not good enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. I must be more conscious. I must be more focused. Now, isn't that stressful? Is that stressful or is that the nature of release? I need to be focused on every conversation that I'm having. I, need, I now need to be mindful at all times of my life. Um, first of all, ask yourself, why? Why put in all this work for what? What's driving you? This is the first thing, your purpose. Why are you sitting down? Why make effort to find peace? Why, how did you come to the conclusion that you can find peace, if that's what you want, by sitting down still or by focusing on, on, on every conversation? And then look directly at your activity. Is it leading onwards to peace? Yes or no? If you're walking through your daily life and then you criticize yourself for not being able to be focused and, you know, on everything in this moment with your present moment awareness, is that peaceful? That criticizing yourself, that trying to be something you're not? 
Because you're not focused. Nobody is. This is important to understand. Nobody is focused. It's, an, it's a, the nature of the mental activity to be unfocused, to be scattered, dispersed, continuously in a shaking, shivering, vibrating state, very much alive. This is mental activity. It's electricity in your brain. It's your hormones, your nerves firing day in, day out. Even at nighttime when you're dreaming, mind isn't focused. Focus would mean complete standstill of everything. You couldn't actually, if you were really focused, you couldn't actually have a conversation. It's impossible. You couldn't even walk. You couldn't do the most basic things in your life if you were truly focused. I'm talking about a single pointed focus on just one facet of experience. If you had that, everything else would disappear. You might have noticed that. For example, if you're daydreaming, let's take something very simple that everyone is familiar with. Daydreaming. While you're daydreaming, you can go so deep into your dream, into your daydream, that everything else around you disappears. Even if somebody comes to you and tries to talk with you, they're not getting through to you. Maybe you hear them mumble. You hear like a kind of um, zoned out sound of them mumbling but it lacks all luster, all clarity. There's no brilliance to it. You're not actually getting what they're telling you. Same happens when you're reading a book and you get really focused on reading a book. All other things around you disappear, don't they? You don't even know anymore that you're sitting at the beach or something like that while you're reading your book. Absorbed in a movie or absorbed uh, watching some reel on Instagram or something like that, while you're absorbed in that, you forget everything around you completely. The deeper the absorption into something, the more you forget everything else. That's the nature of focus. Now, so is focus really what you want in day-to-day -day life? Or is it perhaps alertness? And alertness and focus are two different things. Alertness simply means knowing what you're doing while you're doing it. It's kind of more like a CCTV camera. But it's not a CCTV camera that just focuses on one little rock, for example. And everything else is blurred out. It's a CCTV camera that has a whole overview over what is going on at this moment. Maybe that's what Jagdish is talking about. This is usually what most people mean. They want to be more present, meaning while having a conversation, they don't want to drift off into a daydream. They want to stay with the conversation. While doing work, they don't want to drift off into other things. They want to do the work because it would be more efficient and so on. Now, in order to achieve this, two things are needed. One, you need to really desire it. You need to want it. And there is one thing in life that makes you want to practice and it's suffering. The role of suffering is to kick your butt so that you do something that gets you out of suffering. So perhaps you have acknowledged and you have understood, oh, it's a suffering to not be able to be present in a simple conversation. This is bothersome. This is inducing anxiety. Where is this going? If I'm getting older and older, am I drifting off into dementia? Am I drifting off into complete loss of mindfulness? So that at some point I can't even remember the most simple things anymore, constantly drifting off into some daydreams of the past? That is clearly a suffering. It would be a complete conflict with the life that we have, that we're used to, that we're living in this world. It would render us dysfunctional. You couldn't do the simplest of things if you didn't have this type of alertness. You'd go off into a 7-Eleven store, you want to buy something, and as you reach the store, you've been so lost in your daydreams that you completely forgot why you went out of your house, first of all. Well, what did I want to buy again? And we all know this. We all had this experience. You kind of get up of your chair, and a moment later, you find yourself in the kitchen only to discover that you didn't know why you got here. Like, what was I looking for again? 
that, that is suffering, isn't it? Because it renders you dysfunctional, it would make life really, really difficult. So of course we understand. And it is that suffering that makes Jagadish write this question. How do I deal with this? First of all, you need to desire it. And then you need to put in a lot of effort. Here is a common misunderstanding around this idea of making effort. If you lack purpose, your effort is pointless. And a lot of people make effort without purpose. They make effort because maybe they think, ah, you know, I need to be a great meditator and uh, I don't even know what that means. It's so abstract in my mind to be a great meditator. So I need to make effort to become this great meditator. And then so I'm trying to do this kind of thing. But really, it's not actually my purpose. It's not something that deeply moves me because it's way too abstract to move me. I don't even know what it means to be a great meditator. So if I'm doing something based on this abstract idea of myself, something I want to become, of course I'm not really motivated. I'm not on fire for it. I'm not passionate about it. But that's exactly what you need. If you want to build a skill, you need that level of passion that pushes you forward to actually cultivate that skill. Like every skateboarder knows that. Every artist knows that. Everybody that does something with passion in their life understands that what they are doing is not out of a must. It's actually an expression of joy because they understand the purpose of what they do very clearly. So they're naturally moved. They don't have this idea of like, I must sit down and do my meditation practice. It's like, what are you doing to yourself? Why, why would you do this? It was like, I need to do my hour today because someone told me to do that. This is pretty sad. It's not, it's completely divorced from purpose. That's why it's so important to ask, to ask ourselves, oh, why do I really want this? Why would I make any effort for it? Why sacrifice my time, my energy and my resources to, to get there? to be more alert during day-to-day -day life. If that suffering is strong enough, it pushes you forward, but it's not the only thing that is required. You need to be pushed by your suffering, but you need to also be pulled by the outlook that there is a solution for it. Hence the Buddha presented his Four Noble Truths in this fashion. There's a Noble Truth of suffering, there's a cause for it, and the third one is there is the end of it, which is providing a type of outlook. It's not bleak. It's not just, oh, we are all suffering and done deal and period and done. We're just stuck with suffering, but there is an end to it. It's like someone telling you, well, you have a cancer, but there is a solution for it, so you're fortunate. It's not actually a big deal. You can overcome it. Or you have an, an illness and you can overcome it. It's really bleak if someone tells you you have an illness, but you can't overcome it. There's no cure. It's an incurable disease. Fortunately, suffering is a curable disease. The same kind of thing with the lack of focus. It's a curable disease and you feel it with your heart. You know. So you strive in that direction. Striving for that cure. That's what you need first. In Christian tradition, they would, for example, say that, um, I think it was actually direct instruction of Jesus to the disciples, an instruction on how to pray. You shall love God with all your heart, all your might, all your spirit. And that's it. There's nothing more to be done. You need to love the divine. So what inspires love of the divine? Well, it's suffering, your clear recognition of suffering, inspires the love of the divine. And then that love of the divine will be that very thing that pulls you up. Your eyes are directed upwards, away from the mud of suffering. So you're striving up, you're looking towards God, towards the divine, towards the Buddha mind. And that will then start to pull. As long as your attention is absorbed in the divine, you are pulled by it. 
So what our job is on the, on the level of building, doing, trying, is to seek out the beloved. Question, what is that for you? You need to find that very clearly so you can actually direct your attention somewhere. Let's say your beloved is an increased amount of alertness in your daily life. Then you would seek it out. It's your beloved. It's something that will get rid of your loneliness, of your pain, of your suffering. It's right there. So you're aiming for it. And second, what do you need to do second? You need to stop. The one thing that you cannot do is consciousness, is being. That's something we cannot do. You cannot produce awakening. The moment of waking up is not done by you. Obviously. That's something you can observe. You're not triggering the moment when you're, for example, lost in a daydream. And all of a sudden you become aware. That awareness is not produced. It's not made by you. What then triggers it? What is it that wakes you up? If it isn't you, one, it's your love for the divine. It's your love for awareness. That is waking you up. The more you are in love with awareness, the more it will begin to pull you and wake you up. So these are the two facets that you bring together. One is the seeking out because there is a love for it. And the second one is to surrender to your beloved, to give up your activity, your action, your trying, your intention, and thereby overcoming karma. Karma is intention. Action, karma, is nothing but intention. It is your doing, your trying, grasping, moving somewhere, and so on. And, and this whole machine is driven by ignorance, by identification, by grasping. The moment you wake up, there's a very split second where you're liberated from it. You suddenly see clearly that everything is merely a process, not governed, owned, possessed, controlled by any self. That moment of recognition isn't done by you either. There's no self behind it. There's simply a recognition. So if I seek out more mindfulness, let's put it down onto a more basic level again. If I seek out more mindfulness in my daily life, I need to be in love with that mindfulness. I need to really desire it. I want to be with it. I want to merge with it. The rest is out of my hands. Because of there not being a self behind this. The only thing you can control is what you seek out. And this is what determines who you become. And if what you're seeking out is awareness, is consciousness, well then, your direction is made up and you are being received by it. It's really like this. You are not so much seeking out the divine, but the divine is then seeking out as well. It's seeking out you. If you show, if you show the divine, if you show the core of your being that you desire it, it will begin to pull you. And that pulling is called grace. That's what grace is. The moments when you suddenly are in the middle of traffic and you wake up, that is you're touched by the divine. Why would you be touched by the divine? Well, because you want it. You're seeking it out. You made your prayers in the morning. You're looking up. You're desiring that. Of course, then, throughout the day, you will be graced. You'll be blessed. You'll be given guidance. You'll be pulled up. But that's not because just simply you are a human being and God loves every human being and therefore you're pulled up into the divine. It isn't that. You have to commit to the divine. Hence, the Christians, the Muslims, and so on, they all say... 
you have to, what is it, convert. You have to convert to our faith. I think most people completely misunderstand this idea that you have to commit to the divine. It simply is that. If you are not committing, why would God commit to you? Why would the divine come and pull you up if you don't even desire it? Why would anything in life come and pull you closer if you didn't desire it? And desire is a tricky thing. You can even say that it's not so much what you desire. Desire strengthens it, but it's what you're paying attention to that begins to pull you. It's almost like you're giving life to a thing and that life that you're giving it will begin to pull you. And you're giving it life with your attention. So if you want more mindfulness, desire it and then recognize when you're actually becoming mindful and engage with gratitude and joy. You've just been blessed by something that is outside of your domain. That is the transcendent. It pulls you closer towards that. So it's an act of doing and surrendering, striving and letting go that exists in harmony and in balance. A lot of people, they're so entranced by their doing mind, they want to do it all. You can't. You cannot wake yourself up. You will be either you will be graced or not. And whether you will be graced by awakening or not depends on your commitment to awakening. So this is, this is how we should think of the practice. I'm not saying how you should think of the practice because that's how everybody in the world must think about it. But much more like if you desire to go more deeply, you need to understand that it requires two facets. One is desiring, wanting, striving, and the other is letting go. Put in the cause. Don't worry about the result. The result will be given to you. You just put in the cause. More you put in the cause, more the result will be given to you. The result is something you cannot give it to yourself. You can put in the cause, yes. But the result is out of your hands. So most people, they worry way too much about the results of their actions and their practice. Think about, oh, what will happen to me if I'm... Uh, you know, doing this meditation thing. Like, wouldn't, wouldn't it be the case if I'm overly focused at all times or if I'm becoming very spiritual, then I will lose all my friends because they have other interests. Don't worry about this stuff. It isn't, it isn't important. It isn't relevant. It might just show you that you're not, you haven't really made your mind up. You don't really understand the benefit of it. So you, you're hesitant. Should I really get into this house or not? There could be snakes in it. Maybe I shouldn't go into it. Then it's troublesome. That's why, again, think of your purpose. And even that is very often made up for people anyways. It's just suffering that drives them. And then within their suffering, hopefully, they will find the right solution. Otherwise, they're just spinning around and around without a way out. So don't stress out about trying to be conscious, trying to be more aware. Relax. Just keep putting in the causes and actually recognize all those little moments that are gifted to you where you are conscious. Stop focusing on where you're not conscious. That's not what you want, right? Stop focusing on it. Build it what it is that you want. Well, more consciousness. There you go. I've just 
woken up just this moment. Now I'm here. Wow. Now I'm aware. I'm dropping deeper into this awareness. This is it. Enjoy. Rest right there. Your hard work is paying off. Notice that. Besides, it's just an underlying thing in our societies. This whole thing of not good enough. Everything isn't good enough. You are not good enough. Your actions aren't good enough. Everything's not good enough. As long as you're focused on that, well, guess what you're getting? A whole bunch are not good enough. Including your spiritual work. Isn't yet mindful enough. Not good enough. If you're focusing on that, you'll get more of that. All right, that's all that comes to mind for this. I hope that's helpful. We hope you enjoyed this episode and had a meaningful time. For more information and upcoming events, head over to our website at phuket-meditation.com. Thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day.